Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Everson, and welcome to this edition of the Big East Rewind. And of course, I'm here with my co-host, the superstar himself, Sonny Sparrow. Sonny, how are you today? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I've been looking forward to this show since we started. Oh, I, me too. Since we started. Me too. Listen, uh, you know, I, I was an official at one point in time, you know, in high school, high school ranks and stuff. So I know what it's like a little bit, not to the length that, that these guys were involved, but did you ever have problems with the officials? Did you ever get teed up or have an issue? Nope. I, I, I have one technical as a coach in high school, and I have no idea why. You have no idea? I'm st- <laughs> it wasn't any language or anything? No, or any kinda- it really wasn't. I was sitting down, and everybody in the whole gym was like, what just happened? Right, right. Well, I mean, I think the only T I ever got was in a, a CYO game of all places, which sounds really crazy, like I was some – uh, crazy dad I was a coach and it was a friend of mine that actually teed me up and he uh it was he had a laugh at my expense so it really wasn't wor- noteworthy of a technical foul but today we've got a couple of the best officials uh in the big east uh and and in college basketball so why don't you go ahead and introduce our panel today all right well let me start first with a good friend of mine Beth Ann Ord Shapiro Ord her father was Murph Shapiro legendary official he's not well enough so beth ann is taking his place and we'll speak on plenty of experiences that her dad was part of and we have dick froggy paparo if i'm allowed to call you froggy uh mr paparo when we play and of course the great gene manji i mean these are legendary officials if they were on your game a you knew it was a big game and b it was going to be fun and intense. So welcome, people. Thanks for coming. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for having us. Okay, so let, let's start out with uh, let's start out with how did you get started at being an official? How long were you an official? And and how did you get your start uh, when you when you started officiating? Why don't you take that one, Froggy? Florida, 1968, and I refereed basketball in 2020, and I refereed uh, 22 years in the Division One. I. I went to 20 NCAA's and nine Final Fours. That's uh, awesome. I started was a fluke. Uh, I was working a recreation games and the guy says we wanted to try to get an official and that's how I started no kidding no kidding uh Gene if you, I know you can hear us but do, can you tell us how you guys started officiating okay sure I started I uh, went to graduate school and graduated from Ithaca College went to graduate school in East Carolina and uh, answered an ad for like, down a hardware store, buy a shirt. Uh, we'll call you if we got any games for you. So back in those days, you refereed the girls' game and then the boys' game. You did two games. Now, being from New York State in 1964, we didn't have girls' basketball. I'd never seen a girls' basketball game. So I get a game. guy picks me up, riding the truck to the game. And I says, let's talk about the girls' rules a little bit. He says, okay, wh- what's your concern? I says, they're only allowed three dribbles, right? He goes, don't even count the dribbles. They never take from the three dribbles. That- <laughs> <laughs> One girl could go across the 10-second line to make it five on five. And uh, four and four. And one player from each team could cross the line. And uh, we rushed the girls' game and then the boys' game, and that's how I got my start. And then I came back to uh, Rochester after one year of grad school, took a job and uh, teaching fit that and uh, coaching high school basketball. And Mike Froggy uh, got in the Big East and uh, had a pretty good career. Uh, I didn't go to nine Final Fours. I went to two, but uh, it was a great run. I also uh, – Went to the NCAA tournament 22 straight years. And when I finally didn't go, I kind of thought maybe it's time to uh, retire. I was getting up there in age and uh, 
had some uh, had some eyesight concerns, but other than that, it was a great run. Fantastic, Bethan. What do you remember about your dad when he started? Well, he was a men's coach for a few years. You know, back that's where he started, and um, he all of a sudden did some did some local games and he was still coaching at Monroe community college. And then all of a sudden he was getting a lot more games and these guys could probably tell you a little different, but he started to get bigger games. And that's when he decided, huh, let's see coaching these, uh, you know, at the Juco uh, all these months making this much with four kids or maybe refereeing two games. And after two hours getting to go home, might be a little different so um he started getting bigger games and then he became that's when he switched over to become the athletic director um because everybody has uh, other jobs like mr manji was at uh rush henrietta right coach and yep. uh, he coached as well and then froggy i'm not sure i'm not sure what was going on with froggy on his side his side job but my dad was an athletic director um, but I just remember growing up, it just started to change probably when I was like in middle school, when he got bigger games um, and then, you know, moved up and moved on. But all these guys were, I was a little uh, uh, young girl watching a lot of basketball, watching these guys officiate. I'd watch the game, but I'd also watch the officiating, which was great officiating. Hey. Froggy, how did you, how did it come to being that you got the nickname Froggy? How did that all come about? When I was younger, I had a deep voice like I have now. And the neighbor up the street gave me the nickname Froggy as a kid. And that stuck ever since then. Wow. <laughs> it sure has. It's all through. I'll tell you right now, people don't realize Gene Monty was a great basketball official like Murph Shapiro. But Gene Monty was a great football player at Ithaca College. People don't realize that. Not wow. good. He was a great player. Froggy? Yeah. I didn't know you knew that I played football for Ithaca. You know? Well, I know everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, at what point did you guys, you guys are both doing some college, at what point was the Big East – on your radar as the next college conference to start refereeing. How about you, Froggy? Um, I remember uh, when the league started, they had a, from what I understand, they had a meeting of the supervisors, and they were starting the Big East. And uh, they selected officials out of that group, and they called you up and asked if you were interested in working in the Big East. And we all used to work for the ECAC. So it got kind of hairy there for a while when they were saying, well, if you go to the Big East, you can't work in this. But they ironed that out and uh, got a phone call and went to a meeting in Boston with a bunch of uh, officials that uh, got selected. They went over a few rules and stuff, and that's how we started. And you started a two-man crew, wasn't it? Yep, two-man. Yep. Then they went to three. And I think I don't. I think the down in the palestra they started a year early with three man experiment. Then we went to three man. Well, you know, Vill, Vill, Villanova needed all the help they can get, so they had they had to do it in the palestra, huh, Chuck? You yeah, guys, that's right. That's right. I remember that that game in the palestra. I think you had the game when uh, I, I think we played uh, Georgetown my freshman year. With uh, Ed had a, a big game against Patrick. It was the first time. Uh, I recall seeing three officials work the game at, at, at once. We, it was uh, the Palestra, the Georgetown Villanova game um, when John Pannon was on the team and, and of course, Patrick and um, everybody basically fouled out. I almost got run in that game, Sonny, because everybody <laughs> almost fouled out. So take us through, take us through some of the, uh, some of the characters that you guys had to deal with both, both coaching and, and players. What are, what were some of the coaches um, that were that were tough on you guys back then, back in the uh, in the in the Big East? Yeah, start start with the coaches, Gene. Why don't you go first? Talk about some of the fun coaches you had. Oh yeah, they were they they were pretty intense. Uh, matter of fact, you know uh, we all worked multiple leagues, and people used to say, 
Well, what's the difference between like the Southeast Conference or the Big Ten Conference and, you know, style of play and all that? And I said, no, basketball is basketball. The difference is in the Big East, when the whistle blows, the TV cameras go right to the coaches. And other leagues, it was a, play, a player's game, but the Big East coaches, you know, Karnaseka, Massimino, Calhoun, Bayhunt. Uh, as soon as you blew the whistle in the Big East, TV cameras went right to the coaches to see their reaction, <laughs> and made the league so great. It was uh, it was quite a show, and uh, you know basketball in the Big Ten, the Southeast, wherever the style of play was pretty much the same. But you know, other than Bob Knight and Gene Cady, who knew any of the coaches in the Big Ten? And, and you know, same thing in the other conference. But everybody in the East. You knew all the coaches in in uh, in the Big East Conference. You knew their characteristics. You knew how it, they put on a show, and it was great. It was great. And, and, uh, he knew what he was doing. He went to big arenas, and, and uh, TV focused on the coaches. Mm-hmm. Uh, how about you, Froggy? Who were some of the uh, characters on the sidelines? Uh, I got a couple of good stories. One is. <laughs> Game with Jim Johnson, a three man game with Mickey Crowley and Bobby Donato. Mm-hmm. And Louis Caraseca didn't know who Donato was. So he says to me before the game, Who's the other official? He said, His name is Tony Robiso from <laughs> Louis says, Okay. And in the whole half, Louis kept yelling, Tony, Tony. And no one was paying attention to him. And after at that time, uh, Mr. Crowley says, Louis going crazy over it. He says, Tony won't answer him. He says, Who's Tony? I said, Well, before he got, I told Louis, my, uh, I told Louis Bobby that I was first name was Tony. He kept up with Tony. What a berserk. But a lot of those things we did were, were great. I mean, a lot of things we did with the coaches. The coaches in that league were tough, real tough. I got one great story I tell people. It's, uh, Providence with Joe Mullaney was the coach. Yep. And they were they were playing Villanova. And uh, at, at, up in Providence. And the ball went out of bounds with nine seconds to go in the game. And nobody saw it. And Roley was going crazy. And mm. Joe Mullaney, who was as calm and as nice as could be, Said to me, I said to him, Well, we don't know what's going on. What are we going to do here? I said, I'll take care of this. And I walked up to Joe Mullaney and I said, Joe, you're the only guy I can trust here. Who's the ball go off? Of? He said, Was Villanova's ball? He says, Was off us. I said, Okay, play that. But Roley was going crazy. But nobody saw it. And he called the play, Joe Mullaney. Villanova's <laughs> ball. But those are the things that went on. You could do those things. If you did them now, they'd probably throw you out. Right. How about you, Beth Ann? Did Murph have any good uh, coaching stories? Oh, absolutely. But I think I think one of my my favorites about the Big East coaches, um, how much they gave back. Um, my our fav, one of the favorites is um, they would do the Camp Good Days uh, dinner, and every single Big East coach would come and be part of it. And that was, Pete Pavia set it up. And um, it was such a tribute to to all those Big East coaches. They were doing things like that back then. They really meant something. And to me, that was huge, but I love the stories. I know they were different with me, um, with my dad, because when he was coaching, I think a couple of them tried to, you know, maybe recruit a couple of my dad's guys. So he was, they were a little different at times, like Coach Massimino, um, he was recruiting after my dad stopped refing or stopped coaching. Uh, he would come to town and he maybe stopped over for, he said, Oh, your mom cooks the best Italian, you know, cause he's trying to recruit a kid over McQuaid high school. So they're a little different, you know, with, with us, but there's some great stories. And I love that one, Dick, um, with, uh, with the guys. And if you think an official would ever ask me, <laughs> I know what I would have said. <laughs> <laughs> Dick, let me, add, let me ask you this, Dick. 
when in the Big East, especially it, during tournament time, and and when things get intense and the the place is electric, I know you did a lot of games in the Big East tournament. It, you know, normally if if somebody is riding an official, they yell, "Hey, ref!" You know, and, and amongst other things, right? Was it you guys were almost as popular as the coaches and the players in the league? Everybody knew the officials' names, which I don't think that that happened in any other league, really. I mean, they knew your name. They're yelling, hey, Froggy, instead of yelling, hey, ref, or, or they're yelling, hey, Higgs, to, to Timmy Higgins or or Jim Burr, Larry Lebo, et, et cetera. Respect. Talk about that. I mean, was that, that, did that get to you a little bit as you were officiating that people actually knew your name and – you know, they're calling you by your name? No, not really. I used to pay much attention to them. In fact, that was a joke all the time. I used to have fun with them when they yelled and scream, especially when I had games at Cherokees. So that nah, really didn't bother me. Yeah, now, now, so Froggy, you're from the Syracuse area, and Gene, you're from the Rochester area, so you guys are homegrown officials, right? So when yeah. you did games at Syracuse – were you under a bigger spotlight by, let's say, a Roly Massimino, a John Thompson, who says, hey, I'm coming to Syracuse for some home cooking? Did you get some of that flack from some of the coaches? Well, not, I don't think so, because that was the purpose of forming the Big East and uh, getting uh, their own select staff. Like uh, Dick was alluded to, that we all used to work for the EAC, and I don't know if you remember this, but it wasn't the Big East that first broke away. It was what you call the Eastern Eight. Uh, they were formed a year before the Big East mm -hmm. because they wanted, uh, the ECAC used to have a game on Saturday, the TV game of the week, and it was always the same big school teams. Nobody like St. Bonaventure or, you know, West Virginia or Temple. They could never get on the ECAC game of the week, so they formed their own league, was called the Eastern Eight. They got their own TV, and they got on, they got their games on television. And then the very next year, Dave Gavitt, God bless his soul, he said, hey, if they're doing it, we're going to do it. They formed the Big East, and they got their own officials, and made a cohesive staff, and they said, we're going to send them everywhere. We don't care about how much it costs. We're going to pay them top dollar. And we're going to send them all over the place. And uh, that's how that's what made the league so successful because you didn't care if you went to Syracuse and, and you had to go back to work the next day because you were on the staff and they let you referee and they paid you good money. Not like the money they're paying them now, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, it, uh, it, was, it was a good gig. It was fun. What how about you? Wait, how, about, how about you, Froggy? Did you get did you get any extra grief reffing in the dome when you live, you know, ten miles away? Well, Syracuse, yeah, because I knew everybody from playing ball and being around here, but it really didn't bother me. And they, I, I used to hit them with technicals and everything. Never, never carried it over and stuff. In fact, I talked to him during the summer and during basketball season all the time. We played golf. He's a close friend of mine and a good guy, but. Uh, he never once, well, I mean, completely once went berserk or something. As soon as the game was over, he would never say nothing. I guess he got mad at the, uh, I guess he went nuts after the Georgetown Syracuse game in the uh, championship. All right, look, we, look, let's, 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 I remember that. Yeah, yeah let's, let's have a conversation because we just talked to Andre and Michael Graham just the other day. We had and them both I, on, yeah. Yeah, and Andre asked to say, said, if you see Froggy, ask him, what happened there? Okay. <laughs> the whole run down. There was the play, and I saw, what's his name? Graham throw a punch. Throw a punch. He didn't hit him. I don't know if he hit anybody. At that point, I said, well, he's out of the game. So I motioned that Graham was out of the game. And the red referee, I'm not even going to mention his name, said to me, and we got together. He said, well, he didn't hit nobody. We can't call him, we'll throw him out of the game. I said, well, if you shoot a gun and you miss somebody, isn't that attempted murder? He says, he's got to go. He said, no, you're not throwing him out. He says, all right, how are we going to do this? And the 
official came to me and said, now here's what we're going to do. I'll talk to John and tell him we're not throwing what he told us. And you talk to Ben and tell him we're leaving him in the game and he won't yell at you. He threw you under the bus. <laughs> and, uh, he says, oh, okay. So I went to Bay. I said, Bay. He says, uh, he's not out of the game. He didn't hit nobody. He started moaning and then he stopped. When I told him he was shooting two shots plus two shots and four, he's getting the ball out of bounds. And he, but he went on and on uh, uh, moaning about that game while the game was going on and after. To this day, he's never mentioned that play to me. Never talked about it. Probably better that he didn't. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, those things happen. I mean, uh, I'll own up to I threw them out. They told me I couldn't. I said, fine, we won't. <laughs> what are you going to do? That's <laughs> all. It's just one of those things happen. And they're two great officials that I refereed with. So I said, well, that's okay. But the thing that got me is when he said to me, I'll talk to John and you go talk to me. He won't yell at you. But what are you going to do? He, he probably didn't know Coach Bayheim too well. <laughs> So when you get when you get to a game of that magnitude, when it's a Big East championship game or uh, even a, even a regular season Big East game for that matter, you know you know there's going to be some more a, a level of physicality that you might not see in other conferences. What's your pregame talk like with your partner? Are you do you decide you know in the locker room as you're getting prepared for the game? Is that one of the things that comes up when you say, okay, you know, we'll let them play or we can't let them play because of this or how does that work? Take us through that process. Well, the way we used to do is we'd sit before the game and go through a free game. And then we would say, one thing we would not do is free hats from the game before. In other words, there's a game before and you were elbow and you got pushing people and stuff. We never sat in and said, watch uh, the center play or this year, the, uh, just to get the game flow. Basketball is advantage and disadvantage. That's what I used to say. And if you referee the game at Villanova, call a walk. And then Roly wouldn't bother you anymore. If you call walking, either against this team or for him, then he wouldn't yell the rest of the game. He walked. <laughs> that was Roly's big thing. <laughs> But that's what we used to do. Like, no matter if you walked in and call a walk and roll, he'd be as happy as could be. <laughs> how about how about Eugene? What was your what was your pregame uh, conversation with your fellow officials? Well, the, uh, Dick's right there. You know, we we talk about uh, style of play, and uh, but you know, in the Big East, you uh, you knew it was going to be hands on. Uh, people used to say to me, he "says You know, you guys look. You never call hand checking." I says, "Hand checking." Why don't you look under the basket? What's going on? <laughs> I think Rick Pitino's philosophy was if you weren't touching them, you weren't guarding them, you know? So, um, but I think Mickey Crowley kind of said the best. That it's it's kind of like a rubber band effect. You stretch out the rubber band, you let them play, you let them play, and then if it starts getting too rough, you you got to tighten that rubber band down a little bit. You got to you gotta start making calls. And, you know, we'd... Uh, We'd go with it that way. Were, was there a was there a game that you had been involved with, Gene? That that comes to mind where there was just an, an event in the game that was you know very momentous that you remember, like something happened, and it could be pro con, good, bad, whatever. Are there any games that kind of come to your mind? One story early in my career when when I first started out, uh, like Dick said, we got. I got invited in the Big East, I think, the second year. I wasn't in there the first year. And the uh, first year I got invited in, I, they used to have three-man crews. And uh, if a guy like, say, Joe Mingo was a Boston College graduate, he couldn't work Boston College games. So they would have to bring in a guy like myself to take Joe's place. So I would sub on a crew. And uh, I can remember being kind of aggressive when I first got in the league. I was young and... Uh, it was a whole new experience for me. And I, I was working a uh, uh, Georgetown and Seton Hall game in the, in the uh, Continental Arena or Meadowlands, whatever it's called. Yeah. 
big crowd. And I was a little nervous and uh, I was a little aggressive with the whistle and Don Thompson called the timeout or during the first four minute uh, timeout, he kind of motioned to me to come on over. He stood there all six foot 10 of them with that towel on his shoulder and motioned me to come over. And I went, yeah, coach, what's the problem? He goes, uh, he says, uh, mind you, he says, you see all these people here, 18,000 people. I, how many of you come to watch you referee? <laughs> I, I think there was a lesson I learned right then that, uh, Maybe I was a little too aggressive and uh, I needed to tone it down and uh, just let things happen. But uh, it was a great, uh, great uh, experience coming from uh, John Thompson. He was right on, spot on. And now that you mentioned the Georgetown team, uh, Gene, is it true that when you guys tossed the ball up that Georgetown fouled? If you were next to a guy, you got fouled by one of the five Georgetown players. But you can only make one call. You can only call one. Is that is that what you found to be true? Was that a rumor? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think that's what they called it back in the day, didn't they? Boy, you paranoia? Yeah. 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 You know, you one. I mean, oh, when you oh, played oh, those oh. guys, you had to wear body armor to play those guys. <laughs> Go ahead, Froggy. <laughs> one goal over play. That thing was tough to have. In the pregame, as the two teams come out, I would say to the captains, Benone and Ewing, you can do anything you want. Don't kill each other. And I don't want to hear nobody crying. <laughs> when they played against each other, I let them almost kill each other. They never say nothing. Just let them play. And unless it was all out of salt, I said to myself, let them two kill each other. Because they'd be out of the game in two seconds if you started calling them. And they never complained. Never. <laughs> I, I will say when I was coaching at Pitt in the early nineties um, and we were, we would go play at Georgetown. That's same thing. The girls were the same way, but we didn't have officials like these guys that would let them, you know, let them play a little bit. Beth Ann, is there certain teams that your dad talked to you, you about, you know, when he got home from work and, uh, that, that gave him a tough time or or, or coach or, or, or player from a certain team in the Big East or he thought a game was a little too physical? Were there any stories about, you know, coming home to the family and all of a sudden sharing some of the stuff that happened on the floor? You know, a lot of times I was already, by the time he did a few of those games, I was already coaching. Um, so I would see him like on the road or we would talk, you know, on the phone and stuff. The one thing I will tell you is he never talked bad about anybody. He would always, and as a coach, he always would get on me. I was not allowed to complain about the officials ever, even as a head coach. So um, there's, you know, like I said, the him and Pete would play backgammon, and Pete Pavia every day every day for a dollar and the two of them would just go back and forth. And I'm sure uh, Gene and, and Froggy could tell you stories when they're driving back with my father um, or when all of a sudden they were doing a game at Pitt or I'd come running out of the stands to get my big hugs and seeing, seeing the Seton Hall or um, all the coaches. He didn't really, he never had any bad when he was in the Atlantic 10 you know, because he did that. He was, he did a lot of the Atlantic 10. Um, and I don't want to bring this story up, but coach, uh, you know why we can't, us coaches aren't allowed to uh, yell at officials anymore, right? To the, not yell at them, but complain about them in the media. Because, uh, you know, the big story of Temple when Coach Cheney went after the official that made that call at the end of the game. Yep, it was Murph. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> but we're going Big East, so maybe Gene and, and Froggy can tell you a, a, my dad's story. I think he usually got picked up with those two, um, but he did, you know, he would, he was around them all. We had the best officials in the country right in my backyard, and I grew up being around them, that they were like family friends. I didn't even realize, you know, until I became a coach, and I would see them all the time, you know, you know, oh, we're in the final four. Oh, Okay. You know, Pete's taking my dad with them to their San Antonio for a final four. I had no idea. He's throwing 
he's throwing coach uh, coaches out of the game. You know, that's what I grew up with. It's kind of so much fun to think back and to see these two right here is, is awesome. Is awesome. I wish we had the officials at this caliber on women's games. <laughs> I'm out. Let's, let's let me ask you guys. Is there anything that you remember as like a really funny moment that stands out to you to this day that you remember something happening similar to the call the ball going out of bounds, Froggy, but something that that uh, yeah. that at least either the players or the or the or the coaches got a little bit of a chuckle out of it, human side. How about you, Fred? Uh, one time, I think John Gene can remember it because everybody knew about it. I was refereeing the game with Mickey Crowley, myself, and uh, um, geez, I can't remember his name. He was a younger, but he was an official, just got in the Big East. And Mickey Crowley put gum in his whistle when I was known him. <laughs> and we started the game, and he never realized he had gum in his whistle. <laughs> it was trying to blow it. And he went about it. He didn't. Not what come out. Not what come out. And after the first time out, he's going. My whistle's broke. And uh, he looked in there, and Mickey stopped it a bit. Bubble gum before the game started. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Gene? <laughs> I have a story about uh, Jim Calhoun at uh, at uh, UConn. You know, Are you still there? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Well, we were. Real nutcracker. I mean, and double overtime. I think was uh, uh, you kind of, you know, backyard rivalry there. Game goes double overtime, and Tim Higgins and I think Crowley and myself, and we worked our butt off, and uh, we thought we had a, a really good game. You know, you know when you come off the floor, you if you had a good one or mediocre or whatever, you know, like. Uh, and so as we're going off the floor. Uh, Big East at the time had a rating system where if the coaches gave you a five on a game, you really did good. If you got a, a one or a two, it was a little shaky. You know, you didn't want to get that kind of rating on an individual game. So as we're going off the floor, Calhoun crosses our path. And I don't remember whether he won or not, but he probably did because he said to us, he says, hey, guys, great job. He says, you got a five. Split it up any way you want. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a coach with a sense of humor. When when he said that, I'll never forget that. You know, the three walking off the court or kind of hustling off the court, and Calhoun goes, "Guys, you got a five. Great job. Split it up any way you want." <laughs> That's great. And one of the funniest guys was uh, PJ Carlissimo. He was a quiet. He was really funny. Yes. And he, Great speaker and uh, on the bench, you never know what he was going to say. One one night he said to me, he said, Gene, can I get a technical for one And run by him, you know, and I said, what did he just say? Next time I said, Gene, can I get a technical for what I'm thinking? I says, coach, no. He goes, well, then I says, I think you suck. <laughs> <laughs> PJ. That's funny. So you guys have coached numerous final I'm, – I'm coached. You guys have refereed numerous Final Fours. Tell us some of the stories about the Final Four and, and what was that like for you uh, getting into the, to the spot? Was there butterflies? When you come out to a game, is it like a player coming on the floor? You have butterflies in your stomach and that kind of thing? You get nervous before a game like that, a big Final Four? Go ahead, Frog. I, incident, I, I, I was shocked when I got picked the first time. Um, you get a little bit psyched up a little bit for the games, but uh, you referee the same way you refereed the last ones. They're easier games to referee than uh, regular season games because the games are my, more, more wide open and the players are better. They know how to play. And I always said it's easier to referee in the finals and it is the referee in your championship to your leagues because the games were like wide open and spread open and the, the players played. They didn't worry about anything else. That's what I came out of it with. How about you, Gene? Yeah, I, I, I would agree with uh, Dick on that. Uh, you know, I think when we first broke in the league, uh, I can 
remember being quite nervous. I mean, my mouth was so dry, I didn't, I didn't think I could put air in the whistle. I was so nervous, and uh, guys gave me a little tip. They'd give you a little piece of what you call quench gum. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It's a, a citrus-type gum that'll make your mouth water and uh, tuck a little bit. And, uh, yeah. and you were and that's what it was called. It said, nice, you put this in your mouth here, a little, little piece of quench gum. And, uh, but like Dick said, I was more nervous on those first Big East games, you know, when I was breaking in than I was when I went to the final four, but it was a thrill. Don't get me wrong. But when you get selected, go to the final four, it's a thrill. How does that, how does that process work, Gene? How do you get, how does an official get selected to do the final four? Well, it's changed over time, but in our day, it was very competitive because you started out with 96 referees, and after the first round, you only need 48. So they have uh, observers at the game sitting in all different corners of the arena. And uh, Back in our day, 12 guys went to the first round. You didn't know advance, right, Dick? And uh, everybody had to report back to the arena like at 11 o'clock at night, midnight, and the tournament chairman came in and said, Here's the six guys that are going on next week, and the other six guys, you're done for the year. And it, it was uh, – it got a little hairy in that locker room when uh, guys got that word. Some were happy and some were not so happy, right? Yep. Yes. Go ahead, Sonny. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, they do it that way. You know ahead of time whether you're going to – work uh, one game or two games on that first weekend, and then the rest is done over telephone. But back when we refereed, they came in the locker room after the first four games and told you you were going to stay and work on Saturday or Sunday or you were going home. It was very competitive. Wow. So it's what, 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 was the tra- what was the travel like? Because you, you obviously went from, like, local to much bigger places. Wow. How did they treat you on that? My situation was when I was in the Big East, there wasn't really that much problem because everybody worked and they stayed close. But then when we got spread out and went to the ACC and the other conferences, the travel was tough. I don't know how to even do it now. I mean, yeah, you go from, uh, I do know in the 17 years I worked in the ACC, the commissioner would not allow you. In other words, if I refereed at uh, Kansas, and the next day I was in Carolina, he told you, I don't want you going to Kansas, but you might be travel this and that. He'd say, tell the supervisor you go someplace closer if you want to work that night. They were, he was really strict on that. Now they go all over, so I don't really know. And that was, There's, you flew everywhere, right? Like you got on a plane. Yeah, some places you flew, some places you drove. Now with the, they tell me now what the way the restrictions are on flights and stuff. It's, it, I don't know how they do it. I don't really know how. I also believe, and I'm a firm believer this year, they all work too much. In my opinion, in the old days, you used to work like three, maybe three out of four out of seven days. You got to recuperate. Now, they just go all over, and it's a joke. And it's a supervisor's fault, not the officials. If the supervisor got together and said, Gene Monty's working for me on Monday, you on Wednesday and Saturday and Sunday, we got him back to back. Not the officials say, well, geez, I can get Monty Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It, it, it didn't work that way that time, last year when I was in. They spaced you out pretty good. Now, you work every day, they don't care where you work. And it's amazing to me how a guy can referee in Hawaii in the Rainbow Tournament and the next day working in Orlando, Florida in the first round of the game. I say to myself, I can't believe how they do it. I don't know how, but yeah. that's the way we do it now. How about you, Gene? What was that like, the travel? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, back when, when we were free, we did it as a, as a, uh, a vocation. Now it's a vocation. I mean, we all had jobs. You know, I was a school teacher or basketball coach. Uh, I that's not the, so lucrative now that most of the guys don't have jobs. They don't need a job. They can just referee, like Dick says, referee every night and get paid what they're paying. They, they don't need a job. Back when we 
referee. You know, we had great camaraderie. Uh, everybody got along. Now it's it's more like the NBA. It's a full time job, and uh, it's completely different. You know, like like Dick says, I, I don't know how they do the travel, but uh, restrictions on, on flights and uh, going in the airport way ahead of time. I mean, I used to leave school in uh, 10 minutes. I could get to the airport, run in, and jump on a plane. You can't do that anymore. You know, I don't know how they do it. It's, it's got to be a hassle, real hassle. Yeah. So, so to, in, in trying to uh, bring this all together, talk about – we talked about the coaches – Talk about some of the players. There's a lot of chatty guys on the court. I see players come up to you, especially the point guards. And I, I might be biased being a Oh, player. come on. I might be come biased. I'm sorry. Of course you're biased. You might be. The point guards come up. They put their arm around you. They're talking to you like, you know. Talk about some of the things that was that get said on the court by some of the players. Well, I'll say this here. In the ACC, they had a rule that the uh, – Captain, the guy who's got to go over and talk to the coach. I mean, to the referee. And in Carolina, if you work there, Dean has said every time out, Dean has sent the captain over to ask you. Coach Smith wanted to know two minutes ago to play underneath the basket. I mean, he, I mean, they kept going. Well, I remember one night I had the captain go and have a conversation with me the whole time out, running back and forth to Dean just to make things up. And the players even used to laugh when they said, gee, this is a joke. But uh, it, it, what do you call it? The players were really good. I mean, uh, I always said this. The Big East put basketball on its map. Patrick Ewing was the most instrumental player that I ever, I refereed for Jordan and the rest of them. But for a league standpoint, the Villanovas and the St. John's and the, the players that they had, that's what made basketball. Plus, it was a great, tough league with great coaches. Yep. How about you? How, go ahead. Go ahead. How about you, Gene? Do you remember some of the characters that you dealt with? Oh, yeah. The, some of the great players, Chris Mullen and uh, Walter Berry at St. John's, and uh, you know that uh, going. Up. But uh, I can't re really recall any give and take with with the players. You know, mostly like I say, it, it was a coach's league. Uh, players they they came to play and they played hard. They really played hard. You know. So, so, so this whole thing that Chuck's talking about with the point guards, we can we can debunk it right now. We can literally say that Chuck. Right? Froggy Chuck, right? He's a little this. <laughs> you know, Sonny, down in the post is where, where the men play, just so you know. You got to rough it up down there, especially hey. in the Big East. Not, Listen, not top of the key. You heard what Froggy said. He let you guys kill each other. He didn't care about you guys. <laughs> Listen, I got a story. Roly sent this captain out and said to me, Coach Massimino wants to know us how that guy could sleep. How that guy could sleep with all this noise in the gym? He was talking about the referee. <laughs> and, and I said to myself, what? He says, yeah, Coach Massimino want to know, how could a guy sleep with all this noise going on? And I said, well, tell him we'll take care of it. And that was it. <laughs> yeah. But wasn't your favorite, the referees, I mean, the the maybe the manager, what manager that would always run and get you guys water, the officials? Because I think those guys were the best. I don't think many players did that for you guys. I would if I were them. That's it. And it brings up at, Syracuse, at Syracuse University, there used to be a trainer named Don Lohner, was a great friend of mine. Every time they were on national television, if I refereed the game, he'd say to me, get me on television. And I'd say, I'll get you on here. <laughs> and no matter what, something happened. I said, trainer, come out. And he'd come running out. <laughs> that's the deal I had with him. A lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, How about Jeff? you, Gene? You remember that? Good story. Uh, at Pitt for Paul Evans. And, uh, I was Paul, there. We sent a six-pack of beer up to the referee's uh, locker room after the game. Two beers for each guy. Nice and cold. And uh, the guy who delivered it was a kid named Mark Coleman, who was Paul Evans' assistant at St. Lawrence. At one, He played for Paul at St. Lawrence. He also picked for me at Rush Henrietta. Mark Coleman, great kid. And he followed Evans to uh, 
played for him at St. Lawrence, and he followed him to, uh, I think, the Naval Academy. Mm-hmm. And then Evans came to Pitt, right? So one night, it was, it was Coleman's job to bring that beer up to the officials. So one night, it's Jody Sylvester and I think Bob Donato and myself. And uh, tough game, and Jody Sylvester seconds, which I don't know how many times we call that in a season. But not too often, right? It went against Evans. And I think he ended up losing the game. So up to the locker room after the game, there's a knock on the door, and it's Mark Coleman. And he doesn't have he doesn't have six beers. He's only got four. <laughs> As, uh, this, this is for the rest, he says. But, Jody, you don't get any. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's when I was at Pitt. It was a classic. That's classic, right? Yeah, Coach Coach Evans was a character. He was a character boy, and Mark I worked with. Yeah, w- one last question I got to ask you guys, and this is in relationship to, to Dave Gavitt, because from everything I'm I've learned is he was very instrumental in not only putting players from different um, teams together at the Big East luncheon, he put coaches and athletic directors together in preseasons and they kind of forced a social environment, right? What, what did he do with the officials? Cause you guys have touched on it, but what, what did he do? Froggy, what was some of the things that Dave Gavitt was involved with? Well, with he, the was, officials? he was very, very, very behind the officials, whatever went on. But I can remember what he used to say, that the league used to be tough then. I mean, really tough. And he used to say, it's showtime, just let him play because he wanted to keep the best players in the game and he never interfered with the officials. Never. Never. I talked to him a couple times and he he wouldn't have in regards to officiating and stuff and he never he never complained. I refereed a game with me, him, me and Pete Fabby in a two man game when he coached Providence against Niagara. And he was the same then. He never bothered the officials. No, he never bothered us. He was but did the officials that he want to pay you whatever you said what was fair between them and him when you had the negotiations fine with me, fine did, with me. did he do anything though that 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 he like required all the officials to get together for a training session or a, a kind of a oh, social no. his one thing was that he wanted you to be loyal to the league and what i mean by that is guys like manji and the top top side officials other conferences would call you to play want you to use their services in those days they called you are you open this day and that day and the only thing Dave used to say is that if you're a Big East official your loyalty first is to the Big East so yeah. what you would do is you give the Big East to give you all your dates and then you would spread them out to the other conference that you wanted to go and I remember the year they had it that uh, you couldn't work the night before a Big East game and uh Dave used to pay you for sick home. In other words, he said, we don't want you working the night before you had a scheduled game. You got paid for it. All so right. He was good to us. He was. How about you, Gene? What are some of the things that, that you saw that uh, Dave Gavitt did and put together and et cetera? What kind of culture he created? Well, see, he, he was uh, in the official's corner. Uh, you know, he, he put the staff together and uh, – uh, really, Art Highland was a supervisor of officials, and I think uh, Gavin really turned most of it over to him. But uh, if you needed something, uh, Gavin was going to give you your support. And like Dick said, I think they put that rule in uh, that if you had a, a noon game on a Saturday, they don't want you working on Friday. They wanted you at the site, you know, the night before. They didn't want you flying in at 10 o'clock in the morning after working a Friday game someplace. So, uh, but uh, like, like Dick said, uh, loyalty was a big thing with Gavin. If you, uh, if, if the Big East was your primary conference and they gave you your first and your most, most of your assignments, they expect you to be expected you to work the tournament and not be shopping around. Great. Beth Ann, do you remember anything uh, that your dad uh, related to you about Mr. Well, Gavitt? that's kind of why, you know, with it was really more um, Mr. Highland, but it was um, 
he he was more with like the Atlantic 10 at that point. So my dad only did a few like Big East games, not like these guys, you know, because he was more with um, the supervisor officials at with the Atlantic 10. So it was a little bit different for for pops for my dad. I can right. tell one more Dave Gavin story. <laughs> well, let's go ahead. Uh, my health and uh, well, Keith Fabio was indirectly involved. I was working a, a noon game at, at Pitt, and uh, I got off the plane. And that morning, I did fly in in the morning, like about eight o'clock in the morning. And when I got off the plane, Dave Gavin greeted me and says, uh, "Gene, you're going to have to do us a big favor." And I said, well, "What's that?" He says. Uh, people, it's called, and he's not going to be able to uh, Boston College Georgetown game tonight in the in the Boston Garden, and he says uh, we're stuck. For You're going to lost you there. Game there soon, and then Sorry. you're going to get on a plane and come with me to Boston and work another game. And I says, uh, I'm. I'm allowed to do that. He says, I'm the commissioner. You're allowed to do whatever I tell you. So uh, that's what it, I worked uh, a noon game on TV. And after the game, I met Gavin at the airport. I, I had purchased my ticket right away with a Big East credit card. And uh, we got to Boston and he had a limo, picked us up, <laughs> took the garden. I worked, worked two games that day. And the next day, my phone was ringing off the hook. I must have had 10 calls from officials saying, how the hell did you work two games? They know you did that and you can't do that. And I says, I had the blessings of the commissioner. And uh, uh, that, that was my Dave Gavin, really uh, up close and personal with Dave Gavin. Because uh, uh, Pete couldn't work because he was going through that uh, his cancer uh, problems at the time. Uh, God bless his soul. He was a great one. We'll never forget him. You got Excellent. it. Well, I think we're about out of time, guys. I really, truly appreciate you all coming out today. Uh, we've had our, our special guest today. It's been it's been interesting getting the perspective of, of an official. I don't think anybody uh, has has gotten that type of perspective on on basketball games in in a format like this. So, thank you very much to uh, Dick Froggy Paparo, Gene Manji. Beth Ann Org representing your dad, Murph Shapiro. I'm so glad you were able to do that, uh, Beth Ann. That's fantastic. Once again, you've been listening to the Big East Rewind with myself, Chuck Everson, and Sonny Spera. Uh, the Big East Rewind is produced and directed by Nick Chico Chorus and Daryl Gurney. You can check us out on YouTube, put in Big East Rewind, and our episodes will come up. Uh, please hit subscribe when you look at them. And then you'll also get us on Spotify and wherever else you get your podcast. If you want to make any comments or suggestions for the show, it's Big East Rewind at gmail.com. Once again, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.